Hi everyone on Facebook Live. This is Elizabeth Rich. I'm the commentary editor of Education Week and I'm here with my colleague Sarah Dockery Sparks who's an Education Week reporter and also the writer for Education Week's blog Inside School Research. So we're here in San Antonio. It's the 98th AERA conference. The number of events that you can attend basically looks like a phone book if people still had phone books. So I thought I would catch up with Sarah when we both had a, uh, you know, a moment to talk just to find out what you've been going to that you found interesting, um, any kind of buzz at AERA. So how, first of all, tell me how many sessions have you gone to? It started Wednesday, it's now Saturday, it goes till Monday. So tell us how many do you think you've gone to so far? Well, I've probably gone to about two or three the first day and four or so since then. Um, but your schedule does get so packed that it's always running two or three at a time for one session and you kind of run in, dip in a little bit, and then if things, if you've got a handle on that, you run to the next one. Right, right. And everything is pretty far apart. I think I walked over a mile inside the convention center just trying to get you know, from one event to the other. So it's all very interesting. It is pretty tiring, but it's, you know, it's, it's why we come, right, to find out what researcher, researchers are doing. So tell me, yeah, what, what sorts of things have been you know, inspiring to you and motivated you to think about either writing a story or a blog post or a story down the road? Well, I just got out of a session on from two National Academies reports on how to teach science education and communicate science literacy a little better. And coming on the heels of all of the protests in Washington uh, over support of science, I think it's a really important thing to talk about right now. I see that as a thread. A lot of conversations at different sessions end up with people talking about, okay, well, how can we make this relevant to educators? How can we make this relevant to the public? And that's a theme this year. So any in in interesting um, recommendations in terms of how to do that in the classroom, you know, at the district level, what are you hearing? One of the most interesting things I thought in both reports was we have this definition of science literacy around facts and knowledge and is this molecule bigger than this molecule and that doesn't get at the social aspects of science the way people use science and the process of science as a way of thinking about the world and solving problems and it looks like even as uh, esteemed an institution as the National Academies are starting to think about that more dynamic definition of science literacy. So, and I know you were in a session today where you were referencing some other sessions that you had been to already. So you want to talk about like what you did, what your role was on that panel? Right. I've been on a couple of them. One was on science literacy. One of the ones that I attended recently that was really interesting was on how people are identifying students who are English language learners as gifted or talented. And there's a lot of confusion around that. They are um, the second most under-identified group for gifted uh, programs mm -hmm. right after uh, students in special education. Um, and we really don't know a lot about how to identify them, and how to serve them once they are identified. So just to remind everybody, we're at AERA's 98th annual conference in San Antonio. I'm Elizabeth Rich. I'm the commentary editor for Education Week, and I'm talking to my research reporter colleague, Sarah Dockery Sparks. So recommendations out of that? There were a few. One um, that there's, the researchers are still exploring is using how quickly students are learning their second language as an indicator mm -hmm. of whether they're accelerated generally. Mm -hmm. So if they're still early in learning English, but they're picking it up really rapidly and able to find other ways to show their academic progress, that in and of itself might be a good tag that mm -hmm. teachers can use, even if they haven't been tested with a screener test. The other 
thing that a lot of researchers talked about in the panel was using a universal test for all students in a district, not just relying on nominations from parents or teachers mm -hmm. to get it going. So are you talking about some sort of assessment that might indicate you know, how well they're using their language, that sort of thing? Is that what you mean? I'm talking about in many districts, they find kids for a gifted and talented right. program either because the teacher says, screen this child, right. or even a parent might say, I think my kid deserves additional challenge. And that isn't a really equitable way mm -hmm. to go about it. So some of the districts are exploring using very broad universal um, tests at different ages, even fairly young ages, to try to get kids who might otherwise be overlooked. And so what, where are these districts that are already doing this work for you know, people out there who might be interested in investigating? There were some in Florida. Uh -huh. But some of the researchers were still dealing with um, anonymized yeah. uh, data, so the states didn't quite want to go on the record yet. Interesting. So anything else you want to share? Anything that you're looking forward to going to tomorrow? I will actually be leaving, but I'm curious <laughs> to know what you, you're looking forward to. Well, I've been going to several sessions that have been building on each other mm -hmm. on why it's so hard to keep teachers, particularly new teachers, in the profession. Mm -hmm. This problem of attrition comes up over and over right. again. And particularly um, teachers of color and teachers from um, non-white suburban women, <laughs> they leave at a faster rate. Right. And so there's a lot of interesting mm -hmm. things around what are the role of mentors? What's the role of um, a teacher residency program, mm -hmm. which is sort of like a field work with an apprenticeship. And in some areas, uh, you even have teachers living with host families the way you would on a uh, travel abroad program. Right, right. But they are living in the community that they're going to be teaching in and working with students that they're going to be teaching. And is there any data yet on whether that's actually making a difference or is it too soon to tell? There are about 50 nationwide that met the standards of quality that these researchers mm -hmm. were looking at for a teacher residency program. And of those, there is some promising data on those teachers staying longer, those teachers being more effective in the mm -hmm. classroom, and being less likely to uh, burn out or say they were feeling really stressed in their jobs. So my last question before we sign off is, are these families that host the teachers generally families that are involved in the school system or can be anybody really? Or they did not make that clear? They didn't make it clear and, and it varies significantly from, from one program to another. Not all of the programs had this host family. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed like in the ones that did, they were sometimes members of the community in general. They were often at least connected to the school district in some way. That's really interesting. Well, I guess for more on AERA, folks are going to have to either, you know, follow your blog, Inside School Research, or, you know, catch up with Education Week. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. This is Elizabeth Rich. I'm the commentary editor of Education Week. Sarah Dockery-Sparks, my Education Week reporter colleague. I'll be here till Monday. Come find me. <laughs>